Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another one of our talk at the School of Architecture and Design um, in, in the New York Institute of Technology. Today we have with us Professor Franca Trubiano. And um, thank you so much, Franca, for joining us. And uh, I'll quickly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Franca Trubiano is a graduate uh, group chair of the PhD program in architecture and associate professor in architecture at the Weizmann School of Design of the University of Pennsylvania. She's a licensed architect with L'Ordre des Architectes du Québec. She received graduate and postgraduate degrees from McGill University and a PhD in architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Today, she'll be talking to us about her latest, uh, more recent books, book, Building Theories, Architecture as the Art of Building, which speaks to the value of words in architecture and addresses Trubiano's uh, fascinations with the voices of architects, engineers, builders, and craftspeople whose ideas about building, however faint, have been captured in text. It discusses the context of treaties, essays, articles, and letters by those who have been throughout history committed to the art of building, including uh, Vitruvius, Albel, Alberti, uh, Lelos, yes, Emperor Valle, Le Duc, and a couple of others, including Cropius and Arup. So thank you again for joining us, Franca, and well, you're um, welcome to start when you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Athena. And I'm going to start by actually apologizing for my rather um, less than lovely voice as I'm still curing a cold. So hopefully as I speak, it may get a little bit um, less annoying to hear me speak with this voice. But I want to thank so much um, NYIT, um, particularly professors uh, David Diamond and Alessandro Melis for their kind invitation. And of course, to Susan Sternberg for her assistance in making this possible. I also like to thank um, my former colleague, uh, classmate actually, and professor uh, Tom Verabas, um, who introduced me to the NYIT community just last year. What I'll do is I'll start sharing my screen and hopefully this will be seamless. And I trust that you can see the first slide. Yes, Atina? Yes, yes. Yes, thank you so much. So um, as was suggested by um, Atina, this uh, talk pretty much um, is focused on uh, the particular uh, manuscript that is Building Theories, Architecture as the Art of Building. Now, last Wednesday, um, I had an opportunity to launch um, this book um, at the Weizmann School of Design um, by hosting a little bit of a talk in the Fisher Fine Arts Library, which is this uh, post-Civil uh, War masterpiece designed and built by uh, Frank Furness, a Philadelphia architect. Now, more specifically, the event actually took place here in the Perkins Rare Book Room, where we collected and displayed um, dozens of architectural texts, many of them which were important to building theories. This rare book room houses 3,000 books, drawings, maps, many of them associated with um, architecture and the more um, fine arts, we could say. This book uh, room was originally put together by uh, Holmes Perkins. Um, in the 1970s, when he retired as the Dean of the School of Fine Arts. Now, Perkins was Dean, and uh, just some other images of uh, the books as we had displayed them um, for individuals to look at. Now, Holmes Perkins was Dean for 20 years um, at Penn, and he arrived um, from Harvard in 1951, where he was both um, uh, a teacher, but also a colleague of Walter Gropius and John Joseph Hudnut, who was um, Dean of Harvard at the time. But when he arrived at Penn, he quickly invited and hired some of the most important architects, landscape architects, city planners, and social theorists. Uh, these included uh, Blanche Lemko, Sasha Nowicki, Denise Scott Brown, Louis Mumford, Robert Geddes, Ian McCarg, Louis Kahn, Robert Robert Le, Le Ricolet, Ramon de Gorgiola, Robert Venturi, and Edmund Bacon. Now this collection of individuals we now consider and we call them part of the Philadelphia School, but they really constituted what I would consider to be a team of composite thinkers. That is um, individuals who forged intellectual links 
between themselves to actually make Penn um, an intellectual home of modern planning, architecture, and design during the 1960s. And yet, without any sense of contradiction, Holmes Perkins, the avowed modernist um, who actually transformed Penn's um, architectural curriculum from one of the Beaux-Arts um, to one of modernism, it was him who amassed with an incredible passion these thousands of dusty, old, hardly ever read leather bound books. And the question is why? Well, in this room, I took my first uh, PhD class studying with uh, Professor Joseph Rickvert. Um, it was also in this room that I spent an incredible amount of time studying the work of Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Um, this individual was incredibly prolific. He published um, thousands of etchings during his career of a short 56 years. Um, I show you here, um, Della Magnificenza e d'Architettura dei Romani, Antichità d'Albano, Le Antichità Romane, Campus Marcius, and I can go on and on. But most of all, um, I would say that, oh, and, and just as a kind of reminder, if anyone is interested in the work of Piranesi, you can actually see it right now um, um, in exhibit, many of his original drawings that are in exhibit um, in New York at the Morgan Library uh, of um, uh, in Manhattan. And these drawings are up until June 4th. This is one of the largest exhibits of Piranesi prints. Um, and I would say that um, few uh, have been uh, involved in looking at Piranesi in the last 10 years, except for the Morgan Library and Museum. But when I returned to the Perkins Rare Book Room in completing building theories, it was because it had been so central to my thesis, but also because in this library were books in English, books in French, books in Italian, books in German, books on construction, books on cities, books on materials, books on planning, books on drawings, and even some books that only had drawings. But most of all, these were books that were written by architects for architects. It was in these books that I actually found um, what I thought were words and words that really captured the voices of these architects who have now um, you know, left us for hundreds of years because I still believed that we could hear their intentions. And in this way, I believe that building theories offers us a method for thinking through building. Even as this text is not a book that discusses buildings, but really it's a book that discusses books about building, about buildings, and about builders. And as Atina mentioned, this book um, allowed me to reread Vitruvius, Alberti, Delorme, Le Caminisier, Boulet, Loger, Rondelet, Semper, Villa le Duc, etc., etc., etc. Now, my goal in reading these books was not to substantiate what I thought I already knew about this discipline, but rather to challenge the many decades of accultured knowledge that I had received and accepted about the role of these architects in architectural theory. Now, what I noticed is that they had something in common. They all embraced what I have come to define as the art of building. And the art of building for these architects was actually an act of edification. And therefore it was an ethical act of reconciliation. Now, this journey of close reading brought to light three critical observations about contemporary architectural theory. The first is that architectural theory as a discursive and representational practice associated with a material profession, which is architecture, has during the past half century scarcely acknowledged its origins in building. The second observation is that in not acknowledging its origins in building, architectural theory has evaded an important and possibly fruitful conversation with the intellectually transformative power of matter. And thirdly, that should we aspire to a contemporary definition of architectural theory, and one that maybe might eventually endorse the Vitruvian triad of fermitas, utilitas, and minustas, what is required is no less than an ethical rebuilding and a rebinding of building, design, and theory together. So in many ways, um, building theory is a critique of contemporary architectural theory, in part because contemporary architectural theory has claimed uh, that for decades, 
um, its methods are its content. That is, the theory thinks about thinking. Second, that for some, thinking about, sorry, that for some, thinking and writing about the larger culture that surrounds architecture, whether it's the economic, the environmental, the philosophical, the literary, the social conditions that, of course, impact architecture, that somehow this is identified with architectural theory. And third, that architectural theory is constantly trying to find a home in either post-humanism, post-digital, new materialism, parametricism, or you can read them all, right? Now, that's not to say that these theoretical positions and ideas are not important. They are, absolutely but they're not enough. Required is a practice that restores architectural theory to the subject and the object that is building, to a practice that's fully attendant to the questions that reside within design and construction, and that are shared and communicated in treatises and essays and articles and in letters. Particularly such texts that have been committed to the art of building and that have thought critically about materials, technologies, and practices. And more importantly, let's see these three items, materials, technologies, and practices, as essential aspects of how we evaluate what architecture is. Now, I fully acknowledge that you might be asking yourself, yes, this is a black slide, it's very black. Um, why am I looking at these texts? After all, I am fully aware that these canonical architectural texts have little currency in today's intellectual context. The account of the discipline in these books excludes the voices of many who have labored in the production of the built environment, particularly those whose gender, whose race, and whose socioeconomic status precluded their discursive engagement with architecture. Indeed, but one generation ago, myself, the child of an immigrant, working class, and an Italian woman, would scarcely have been even able to complete this manuscript. However, as Harvard professor of public philosophy Cornell West stated in an opinion piece for the Washington Post, when Howard University decided to disband its classics department, quote, academia's continual campaign to disregard or neglect the classics is a sign of spiritual decay. decay. Those who commit this terrible act treat Western civilization as either irrelevant and not worthy of prioritization or as harmful and worthy only of condemnation. He says we must be negligent, excuse me, he says we must be vigilant and draw the distinction between Western civilization and philosophy on the one hand and Western crimes on the other. The crimes spring from certain philosophies and certain aspects of the civilization, not all of them. So let's take a look at this little journey that I created in um, building theories. The first two things, one, the title, and then secondly, the chapters. So I've made a point of suggesting that architecture can be an art of building, and that is because I would like to build on and amplify the voice of another colleague, Stephen Parcell, who actually offered us an incredible understanding of a kind, an origins of architecture from an intellectual perspective when he described architecture moving histori historiographically through four concepts. Techne, architecture as techne in the ancient Greece um, context of building, architecture as mechanical art, in the Middle Ages, architecture as diseño during the Renaissance, and architecture as fine art during the 18th century and the 19th century. Architecture as techné is one of the most beautiful and poetic pieces of this work, wherein um, Stephen Parcell reminds us that at the very beginning of time, materials were in fact um, conceived to be wholly, wholly alive, wholly filled with the kind of life energy that we would only hope our buildings continue to have as we transform wood and stone into built artifacts. But um, I start with architecture as a mechanical art for we can see that there are many representations of when in fact builders were part of the kind of hierarchy of 
skills and trades for which masons and master masons and journeymen were part of a narrative of um, building uh, constituted um, through, let's just say, a discipline um, based on the crafts. We also remember um, that architecture as um, diseño as originates in its alignment with the fine arts, the visual arts. And in fact, when drawing starts to achieve the ability to draft lines that represent intentionality, we basically enter into the Academy of the Arts of Design, a very important moment for architecture. And I show you here some representations of where mathematics and perspective become part of the underpinnings of how architecture is understood as, a, as, as diseño, an art of design. And of course, we understand what it means for how we begin to conceive whole utopic visions of Renaissance cities and even Baroque cities. And I continue with architecture as a fine art where in the 18th and 19th century, we understand that the ability for the architect to give context to a full set of renderings and a full understanding of the representational arts um, makes of architects equivalent to painters. But if I'm going to introduce um, architecture as an art of building in the context of those four that Stephen Parcell offered us, I do it in the context of seven um, and what I really call eight chapters. Let me start with thinking through buildings. Chapter one. In thinking through building, um, this reviews actually the most recent past of architectural theory, I say between 1970 and the year 2000, when architectural theory operates under a conceptual turn in which um, architecture is understood um, in relation to critical theory, uh, where schools of architecture in the United States and in the Anglo-Saxon world really cement um, a culture of critique and contestation. For decades, journals such as these feature and celebrate the various faces of this debate. And I would say that a really important moment um, in this turn towards conceptual architecture happens in the 1970 edition of Design Quarterly um, that features a series of articles by the groups um, identified through Archigram, Super Studio, and Ant Farm. But it also had a very important article, an opening article by Peter Eisenman. Um, his article is called Notes on Conceptual Architecture Towards a Definition, which is actually precisely that. It's a series of 15 footnotes what you see on the right-hand side is the actual print of the journal. There is no text, but there are a series of numbers on the page that make reference to the footnotes here at the bottom. Now, this was a demonstration of much intellect. In this early form of print art, the architect had branded his theory of dematerialization um, as a young enfant terrible of American architecture. This was really a playful piece and a very important piece. But we are left essentially with a location of footnotes where the footnotes are in essence the site of Eisenman's textual narrative, which references critical sources um, in conceptual art. The message is pretty clear that in order for architecture to really be a work of conceptual architecture, it needs to be operating in the space of conceptual art. Now we know that um, only if architecture is to lose uh, its burdens of materiality, really can it be considered conceptual. And this has in large part been Eisenman's focus throughout his career, even when building. And I show you here the image of the Wexner Center. However, um, almost as quickly as the turn of the millennium that we saw in the year 2000, conceptual architecture and practices of critical theory almost cease and desisted in part because of the precipitous rise of all things technological. I don't have to describe um, the extent to which uh, networks, circuits, sensors, algorithms, data, drones, nanoparticles have all changed uh, the architect's imagination. In many ways, uh, the end of critical theory is in part the result of environmental crises, theories of the Anthropocene, uh, the proliferation of energy metrics, and even our much needed realignment of architecture relative to questions of community engagement and social justice. But I would say that maybe architectural theory's greatest trial during this period has been its own perceived sense of irrelevance. Interestingly, the recent past of architectural theory has failed to notice one thing, that prior to the mid 20th century, 
The very body, matter, and think the thingness of building had always been present in theory. And that's where I basically begin um, chapter two. In Building and the Treatise, I introduce the reader to the long history of the art of building in its detailed review of pre-modern characterizations of building. Now, notwithstanding um, that in you know, post-68, um, when writing about history, um, we seem to isolate the definition of the architect to one characterization. Um, in the pre-18th century world, architects often spoke of themselves in hybrid conditions. I'll be showing you here um, images uh, from 15, 39, 1567, 1572 editions of Vitruvius by either um, Italian or French or um, Latin authors. Um, many of us remember Vitruvius as kind of giving us one of our first texts within the discipline. And Vitruvius's commitment to both the practice, what he called the fabrica, and the theory, what he called the ratio, and in that order of architecture, necessitated on the part of the architect mastery of elemental, the basic elements, material, matter, situational, site, and environmental conditions of edification. His promotion of ratio or reasoning was really understood as how you demonstrate scientific principles. And you did so in full view of material lessons. I show you here his context of how you would build in community, the fact that human bodies basically give us our dimensions, and the fact that Walls are made of um, masonry in various kinds of patterning for the Romans. He also described, notwithstanding that these are not his drawings, but drawings by his interpreters, he did describe ways of building in wood. He did describe the tools and the um, measuring devices that we need in order to build. In other words, building tools. He did describe war machines that architects should have been familiar with building. And he also even described water wheels for extracting materials water from the ground in order to build more materials. And here you see him describing um, city walls and the construction of actual city walls for fortifications and protecting. And here, triangular tile work. I speak about a number of these individuals um, during the 16th century. I'm just gonna focus on one more, the French master mason, Philibert de Lhomme. I find him most illuminating in part because he was in fact a master mason and he thought it was important to give the French, um, let's just say, a humanities-based understanding of their discipline. For the French master mason and humanist, Philippe Delorme, geometry was always in service to material metamorphosis. An infinite number of stone shapes could be traced, cut, and their weight dissimulated with the mastery of Euclid's rules. I show you here in a, a drawing on the left-hand side, which is part of his treatise um, and an image on the right-hand side of one of his constructions in which he is informing Master Mason's pre-Rhino, pre-Rhino um, vault, how it is that you can actually trace this in matter, not in virtual space, but in a block of stone to be able to create these incredible structures. And I show you here what essentially is a cantilevered structure, uh, one of the only um, that remains from Philippe Delorme's work. Um, absolutely phenomenal. Now, evident in all the treatises that are discussed in chapter two is the importance of integrating the making of architecture, that is its fabrica, with its reflection, its ratio. And here I show you that Philippe Delorme is so interested in this that he actually um, goes um, so far as to educate us on what might be a non-ethical architect on the left-hand side and an ethical architect on the right-hand side. Needless to say, the ethical architect um, has no hands, is in a barren landscape, whereas the um, ethical architect has many, many hands, a third eye, um, and much growth and vegetation to support his work. Now, the third chapter, Architect as Builder, outlines one particular case study of the French architect and educator Jean-Baptiste Rondelet, whose insistence at the beginning of the 19th century that his colleagues be skilled in more than just drawings and renderings was less 
um, I should say it was more than explicit. He claimed that architects must learn to measure, test, procure materials, organize labor, manage the site, and judge the quality of the work and of its craft. In this, Hondelet articulated an art of building that was intimately tied to a prescient theory of what I call the nature of materials, even if in his eagerness to um, uh, speak about the art of building, he may have been um, assimilating um, his theory to a near science. Now, as builder and author, he um, was charged with completing the dome of the Church of Saint Genevieve in Paris, a rather fascinating, um, let's just say, commission. Um, and in support of this commission, he actually published a number of texts. He taught construction to architecture students. He encouraged them to be masters of the building site, as well as masters of the graphic pen. He introduced the science of materials to our discipline. And as I said, he was the um, builder of the Pantheon's dome. There are many other lessons that I can offer in the example of Rondelet, but I will just cease there. Chapters four, five, and six speak to other um, ideas as well. Chapters four speak to the fact that during the 19th century, architects struggle with having to contend with the fact that as we move from stone building to iron building, we undergo a dematerialization of architecture without a theory to support it. I offer an opportunity for us to look at um, Yudel Le Duc and Gottfried Semper um, as individuals who gave us the first example of composite thinking or composite imagination in light of the dematerialization of architecture. In chapter five, I look at questions of language. I ask us um, to ponder the importance of translation. I recognize that up until the early 20th century, our German colleagues hardly ever use the word architecture, but actually use the word Baukunst. And that is not a minor difference. Baukunst is the art of building. And yet in the 1970s, the same period that I spoke about in chapter one, when architectural historians translate all of these texts from the German, they use the word architecture. That shows essentially the hegemonic overtake of architecture theory in the 1970s, not um, willing to recognize that maybe there are other narratives encoded in language, in German, in the art of building. In chapter six, I make the argument that in order for us to really operate um, in the art of building, we might want to look at an ethics that transcends visualization, transcends aesthetics, enters into the realm of matter, and offers us potentially ways of thinking about a return through notions of making, craft, details, tectonics, surfaces, metamorphosis, maintenance, and error. But what I'd like to do now is, as, way of, as a way of kind of concluding, actually just focus on chapter seven and eight. To do this, I will, um, for a moment, just switch out um, and maybe just stop sharing if I can get to the... Um, Let's take one brief second. I will stop sharing. I will restart sharing another. All right. And I hope that you could now see this one. I trust, Athena, that you can see the images of Gropius and Arab. Thank you. Okay, great. So, as a way of kind of coming to really the most um, sort of critical point of the argument, because essentially if I'm suggesting that the art of building um, um, would like to sort of um, operate in the space between design and construction, in the 20th century, this fissure or this gap is really best represented um, by our ongoing relationship between architecture and engineering. I guess no better place to have this discussion than NYIT. Myself having been um, a faculty member at Georgia Tech, um, I understand all too well the kind of history in um, United States between schools of architecture dedicated to the Beaux-Arts model and institutes of technology um, predicated on the French model of the Polytechnique. It's still with us even today. So in chapter seven and eight, I, I look at um, our, our friend on the left-hand side, Walter Gropius, German architect and pre-World War II emigrate to the United States who founded really the most transformational school dedicated to the art of building, which was the Bauhaus. 
Um, he um, also promoted a narrative of professional integration and collaboration that he was actually openly chastised for during the heady days of modernism. Um, on the right-hand side, Arup, a Danish educated engineer and transplant to London, England, invented really the very concept of integrated systems design, and he championed really the need for new forms of representation in engineering to render visible the invisible, those forces, the energy, those flows that are very much present and consequential for understanding the built environment today. Now, I argue that both Gropius and Arup bore witness to the power of what I'm calling the composite mind, with its ability to unify qualities and quantities, matter with mind. In this composite mind, I, I believe that there are sympathies with the other and potentially a way for paving um, a reconciliation between design and construction. Now, the year was 1966 when architect Walter Gropius corresponded with engineer Ove Arup. They corresponded the old fashioned way via hand delivered post uh, many decades before the internet, before texts, and before instant messaging. The architect uh, taught uh, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, and the engineer worked in London, England. And they wrote to each other when Arup, the engineer, won the 1966 RIBA, or the Royal Institute of British Architects Gold Medal. But this was not the first time that these two men had shared words, shared affinities, shared affections and opinions for addressing what they diagnosed as missing in the building industry and for repairing what they saw as the design and construction divide. A divide that really is exemplified by the very professions of the architect and the, en and the engineer. So, are architects and engineers friends or are they foes? Architects and structural engineers have been colleagues for sure, but they've also been rivals for centuries. They've competed for preeminence in matters of building. They've challenged even the very definition of their respective disciplines and they've debated each other's values in matters of construction. Now, even today, each participates in bringing to life a building, even as their practices, ideas and agencies are sometimes opposite. Now, historian Andrew Saint reminds us in this amazing text of the intimate relationship between the one who designs and the one who computes in Architect and Engineer, a study in, in sibling rivalry. But tonight, I will focus briefly on one moment in the recent history of this struggle, wherein perceived antinomies between the art of architecture and the science of engineering were suspended in service to a 20th century interpretation of the art of building. So as noted, the year was 1966 and uh, the date was August 5th. And here is this congr congratulatory letter um, to Arup. I'm gonna read it. My dear Arup, not my dear Ove, my dear Arup, you can already um, identify that um, they're branding themselves with their names. You can hardly imagine how much I have been touched by your most generous letter. We'll look at that in a minute. The unexpected always makes the strongest impression. Our vanity, aiming for try to subdue it, needs now and then a pat on the shoulder, and I am grateful to you. With gusto, I read your paper. Hmm, I guess he must have received a paper. You build not only physical bridges. It is important that such a broad gesture comes from an engineer. You have been too polite, though, towards the architect but surely the occasion called for that. Now, on the other hand, you are too modest regarding your own role and that of the engineer. I myself find it very difficult to interpret the differences between architects and engineers regarding the creative, the inventive qualities involved in their contributions, particularly as I see, and as you do, the conceptual process as a total entity, form, structure, and economy being inseparable within it. To conceive the bones of a building rightly so that they fulfill these three requirements is an organic, creative act, just as the architectural composition of the building masses. I fully agree with you that the emphasis should be, therefore, on the team. Education of architects, engineers, and artists alike must, first of all, 
be directed towards understanding and accepting the collaborative process, the composite mind, which by itself will make for more humility and mutual respect, and I believe will be of benefit to art. Within this process, the final control will fall to that individual who has the broadest scope and is willing to accept from his teammates everything which can enrich the total conception. You have shown evidence in your work that this can be done either by an architect or an engineer. Good reason to be happy. Yours sincerely, Gropius. Well, uh, as Gropius clearly noted, there was much that one could point to illustrate the gravitas of Arab's contributions. He was the most famous engineer of his generation. On July 15, 1966, his ideas for Teams for Total Design were published by the London Times. In January 1967, he was featured in a primetime BBC television program, Builder Extraordinary, Ove Arab, the story of a shy rebel. Arab the engineer had become a household name, and this is why. I mean, for many of us who remember these projects, the building of the um, uh, Jorn Utzon's majestic shells at the Sydney Opera House was a drama all onto itself, let alone that this was an opera house. It was a drama all onto itself with many, many years of protracted negotiations between architect and engineer, some of it ending in you know, less than happy circumstances, but in essence, lifting these pure shapes into the air was a serious endeavor, one that required many forms of technology innovation that I'm not gonna be able to show tonight, whether it was innovations on the ground, in situ, in place, re-understanding of the values of geometry, and of course, computation that was used here for the first time with um, the use of Pegasus computers. But you can see here that just the work on site was strenuous and tremendous. Um, scaffolds had to be designed. Uh, uh, these, um, this actual arch structure had to be built in order for the um, actual project to be built. Um, the precast um, members were created on site. Um, the factory was um, on the site and lifted into place. It was actually an incredible um, operation. Um, if only to say that one had to engineer this entire um, process of delivering the design to its construction. And hence, by the mid-1960s, this engineering uh, feat became uh, the marker of um, Ovi Arab's career. So that um, Gropius's letter celebrated Arab's um, achievements um, is clear, but it was also a thank you note. It was a thank you note because days earlier, Arab had actually sent Gropius this article. It was an article that he wrote. It was, in fact, his acceptance speech for the RIBA um, medal awarding um, um, ceremony. And he shared his thoughts on art and architecture. Here, the architect colon engineer relationship. For decades, Arab had written and spoken about this and other matters with his colleagues. His was a lifelong dedicated to writing, having published dozens of articles, letters, opinion pieces, having left hundreds of pages indicating his research, his reflections, and even more exhilarating, his doodles. Some of his titles included the interrelation of structure and architecture, architects, engineers, and builders. And the engineer looks at architecture, the education of architects, future problems facing the designer, and even the prospect for humanity. He certainly had much to say. And it's not without some irony that his RIBA article captured his thoughts as an engineer that were critical of architects. He was wanting to make sure that his audience recognized that having been only the second engineer to receive the RIBA prize, the first one, of course, having been Luigi Nervi, architect and engineer, that he was going to be clear to point out that engineers do not service architecture. He stated, can one really serve architecture as an engineer? He says, no, not really, especially if we don't know what architecture is. Remember, he's speaking to architects in the audience. 
he's asking them, what is the fundamental difference between the architect and, and the engineer? Is there any? And he says, when does an engineer become an architect and vice versa? And then he asks, how should architects and engineers collaborate? In this text and in others, Arab argued for a critical assessment of the limits and the overlaps between architecture, engineer, and building. He offered advice to engineers. He says, engineers really assume their full responsibilities only when they are empowered to critique architectural intent, especially if that intent runs counter to the ends of building well. And he says, the engineer's independence of thought is absolutely necessary if they are to collaborate with architects. But you know, he also had things to remind architects about. When he asked them, what role should art play in architecture? Because after all, he was asking this question about what, art, what role should art play in engineering? He says, this question would certainly split the architectural profession and the architectural critics into several factions. Remember, he's asking this in 1960. Six. It's no secret that Arab openly questioned architects who engaged in what he called, quote, esoteric discourses that privilege the rules of composition and design and for whom the most accomplished definition of the architect was that of the artist designer. Now to be clear, and as I've already noted, Arab was no less critical of engineers, especially those down to earth sort of persons who know what they're doing when applying scientific principles and, use, and using logical reasoning and who leave nothing to chance. However, he says in the best of circumstances, architects understand that the art of building must include scientific principles and engineers are aware that matters of art are important to their practice. The reason is because when engineers are well-versed in matters of art, they can, avoid, they can avoid this. They can avoid the enemy that's lurking around the corner. And what is that enemy that's lurking around the corner for Arab? Building technique that has its own economic logic that imposes its own discipline, which left to itself will take no account of art or true amenity. That, he says, is the danger. What is the antidote? Good design. Good design should embody a sensible way of building. Design is the key to successful execution. Things should not be left to chance. The design should embody, foresee, and specify all the phases of execution. And the designer should always think of how this design can be executed. When we look at some of Arab's own work, we can't help but essentially be inspired by the advice that he gave most engineers, whether it's his Kingsgate footbridge that I show you here, which in the way in which it was built reveals its own sense of artistry relative to the act of making and the act of, and the act of expressing that making. But the question is, where did, um, sorry, I just wanna make sure that I didn't lose the slide. I think I may have lost the slide. That's okay. Um, but where did um, Arab learn the act of collaboration? Throughout his entire career, he was always sure to give merit to his work, his early work in the 1930s with the Tecton Group. For decades, he discussed um, how in working with this group, he was able to really hone his skills of collaboration. He said, when working with the Tecton Group, collaboration was perfect. As an engineer, he was allowed to make a real contribution to the architecture and to construct what was designed. An ideal collaboration between architect and engineer and contractor was possible when working with Tecton. The projects that he worked on included the Penguin Pool that you see here under construction and you see him in the Penguin Pool, uh, which is in the London uh, Zoo. Um, the pool, um, it says 1934, but that's much more recent as an image. Drawings from Tecton, 
of the pool, and of course, in situ with our penguins. But he also worked on the High Point Apartments at Highgate in 1933 and 1935, an amazing project, which actually looks as resilient today as it did when it was first built. And there's a whole series of kind of conceptual strategies for how to structure apartments using the box frame in this particular project. But I show you here some incredible sort of juxtapositions between the highest level of modern architecture and reference um, to the origins of architecture. But probably one of the most incredible projects from that period, the Finsbury Health Center, which for so many different reasons is really one of the first fully environmentally and structurally integrated buildings ever to have been built. Um, there are a whole series of uh, narratives about this building having been published um, during this period, um, how it became the kind of signature for um, column-free building, for clear spans, for structural skins, um, for integrated building systems, on and on. Um, so much so that um, Tecton produced these series of explanatory drawings that in many ways I consider to be the first integrated set of drawings um, that we have in our discipline, talking to us about cross ventilation, rational construction, ducts for, ducts for power uh, wiring and ducts for plumbing um, and invisible radiant heating. All of this, by the way, for a building that was intended to alleviate and to make humans healthy. Finsbury had one of the highest incidences of human um, uh, illnesses in Eastern London, uh, in East London during this time. And the building of this building was kind of signatory for human health and integrated design techniques. You can see here what essentially is the fabric um, of London during this period. Uh, by the way, uh, by way of bombing and other circumstances, this whole area back here is a huge park, um, contributing much to the uh, question of human health in this environment. And I show you here some contemporary images of the Finsbury um, Center. I'm happy to say that um, there are campaigns to restore this building um, to its former glory. But I wanna stop here uh, because this is essentially the kind of sum total of Arab's um, belief in total architecture and total design that Finsbury represents. When he offered this key speech to all the employees at Arab uh, in 1970, he declared that um, not only are structural engineers looking for overall quality, fitness for purpose, and satisfaction of forms, needless to say, we're talking about here the Vitruvian triad, um, but all of this requires us to work with our joining fields, architecture, planning, environmental engineering, computer programming. Only in this way can really total architecture arise, and only in this way do we see the ability for an integrated, well-organized team to reach what he calls artistic wholeness. There are times when I read these words and I'm not sure whether they're Arabs or whether they're Gropiuses. For Arab, integration was absolutely essential. So too was the ability to cultivate what he called the composite mind. In order for the wealth of new knowledge, new materials, new processes that are so wide in the field of possibilities, only total architecture will be um, possible with a composite mind because it cannot be surveyed adequately by a single mind. Well, this principle was not only that of an engineer, it was also that of an architect. Arabs, R-I-B-A, um, sorry, I think I may have lost access to my computer. If you can just bear with me, there we go. So Arabs, I hope you can still see that. Um, Arabs RIBA remarks delivered to what was surely an audience of absolutely well-heeled British architects, identified many living architects whose work and whose words he happened to admire. In this list, he had not forgotten to mention Walter Gropius, whose prominence for having founded the Bauhaus was markedly evident in the wide currency, which ideas, of course, on functionalism had once had, but also still had in 1966. Indeed, this was not the first time that actually Arab had been referenced, sorry, that Arab had referenced Gropius in public. In an interview that he gave in 1964, Arab mentioned Gropius amongst many other architectural luminaries, including Maxwell Fry, Lubetkin, and Le Corbusier. 
Now, more critically, in an address that Arup delivered in 1967, he lamented the fact that the profession had favored Le Corbusier's artistic genius over Gropius's ideas. According to Arup, Gropius had really hoped to identify a new social conscience for architects. But what did Arup really mean by this social conscience for architects? I would claim that this meant expanding the architect's responsibilities to include matters of project execution and project delivery. And I show you here images of, in fact, the um, set of conversations that were had over the years with Gropius and with Le Corbusier um, actively debating uh, questions of representation and questions of the profession. But really, um, it was here that Arup spent most of his attention and wanting to um, give voice to Gropius. When Gropius, quote, had made it the concern of the architect, not only to interpret and execute the brief, but to be a party of the brief. Now, what does it mean to be a party of the building brief? Well, I show you here, publication from the 1950s, early 1950s, where here is Walter Gropius, reacting to what was then called the AIA rule number seven. Here he is, a professor teaching at Harvard, and he's writing in the architectural forum about how sad it was that the AIA had instituted rule number seven. And in rule number seven, it basically chastised architects for having any part in the economic brief of building a building. Um, he launches this debate in print um, there are reactions to the Gropius challenge and individuals go back and forth with either agreeing or disagreeing with Gropius's brief. For Gropius, fearful of the profession's future, he urged architects to regain their position as master builders through closer contact with actual construction and closer teamwork with engineers and builders. As it says here, notwithstanding rule number seven. Now, what is rule number seven? Now, here it is in the most pedantic, fright, frightfully bureaucratic possible delivery. There it is, rule number seven. An architect may not engage in building contracting. Wow. With one sentence, right, with one sentence, we had basically undone what was the history of architecture in the art of building. This would, of course, would not be okay for the chair of the Department of Architecture at Harvard. Arup had written, well, let me back up for a second. Arup responded to a certain tele a telegram that Gropius had sent him as soon as Gropius heard that um, Arup had won the RIBA. He sent him a telegram, congratulations. And Arup wrote back, wrote back this very, very short note. It's in these um, very small pieces of paper, um, and I'm just gonna basically show it to you here. Most of the text says this, and this is Arab speaking to Gropius. I wanna tell you how much I admire what you have done for architecture, but more than that, for what you are and for what you have meant for me and so many others. It's not so easy for me to write this, for praise has been devalued or devaluated by its use as a social lubricant or a form of flattery. And I think that you have had enough of that. What you have not had enough of is of the practical application as distinct from the theoretical acceptance of your ideas. Quote, now this is Arab, spe Arab speaking. There would not be so much bogus architecture today had they been heated more. And what he means by they, meaning his practical applications. For Arup, an insufficient number of architects had modeled their everyday practices after Gropius's. They had failed to do what he did, even if they claimed to believe what he believed. This is what Gropius believed. He believed in collaboration. I have come to believe that the changes in needs and methods of production and that the increase of building industrialization will force architects in the future once more to draw closer to the building profession, to become a member of the building team, together with the engineer, the scientist, and the contractor, he believed in this. He also believed that the working teams of the great cathedral builders 
were organized in such a way that every journeyman and apprentice contributed his part of the work independently, only obeying a general geometric idea of proportion prescribed by the master builder and carrying it through all part of the building. He believed in integrating social, technical, and aesthetic components into a humanly appealing whole. And he believed that the architect's performance really was within a collaborating team. He believed this, but according to Arab, few architects practiced this. Gropius practiced this. He practiced this when he built the Fagus factory, collaborating with industry members for the purposes of architectural invention. And I show you here some um, images from really early on in our history of architecture. He believed it when he founded the Bauhaus, where collaboration and workshop training was a new form of education. Not only did he believe it, Gropius practiced it. And I show you some images of the context of community and playfulness and the sites were in which architects actually practice design in workshops. And he also believed and practiced it when he um, put forth the package house where um, he brought design to the building industry for solving the issue of prefabricated housing. One of the most complicated projects to date that architects continue to avoid, continue to shun. So with this model of practice in mind, um, that of the master builder, um, collaboration and integration were absolutely essential. So much so that this is where Gropius developed his own idea for total architecture, um, a book that was published, as you can see here, often and a lot. I don't know of any book that had three editions um, in under 10 years. In order to perform total architecture, making was central. Making is certainly not a mere auxiliary to thinking. It's the basic experience that's indispensable for the unity of purpose within the creative act, which is thinking. And for teamwork, students should be trained to work in teams for the nature of teamwork will lead the students to do um, good and well-coordinated architecture rather than what he called flashy or quote, stunt design. Now, when Gropius, you see him there in the center, um, was asked by his students um, to participate in the creation of the Architects Collaborative, this was essentially um, a team that involved itself in a whole series of built projects, whether they were homes, schools, hospitals, institutional buildings throughout the world, um, as an innovative venture in professional self-governance which I should remind us is also what Arab was when Arab founded Arab. Um, it was not based on the typical corporate structure, neither was the architects collaborative. I don't have time to go into the kind of social and kind of political and corporate and economical um, con concepts within the founding of these two profession professional bodies. But when they founded TAC, its roster of eight equal partners um, offered a fully cooperative structure and hence it made identifying the firm's prima donna very, very difficult and it actually gave Gropius much enjoyment. Women represented one quarter of the senior leadership and job captains were designated collaboratively. Without the slightest sense of contradiction, this is how Gropius asserted that architects um, were really now indispensable leaders by working collaboratively. So hence, to conclude, um, returning to Gropius's congratulatory letter that was sent to Arab in 1966, he affirmed his belief that architects and engineers had much in common, particularly in what concerned their creative and inventive qualities. The next generation of architects and engineers would do well to aim at understanding and accepting the collaborative process. Within this process, the final control will fall to that individual who has the broadest scope and is willing to accept from his teammates everything that can enrich the total conception. With their language nearly identical and their aspirations equally so, both Arab and Gropius sought synthesis amongst architects, engineers, and builders, and they both sought principles of total design and total architecture. Truth be told, 
teamwork, collaboration, and fostering the composite mind remains as relevant today as it was in the summer of 1966. And that is essentially the argument that underlies building theories. That is, in bringing back to memory the long history that is the art of building, we're sure to remember that we have always had the capacity to integrate and bridge the divides that exist between matter and thought, construction and design, technology and representation, engineering and architecture. And I hope that these few examples indicate that we've been able to do so in the past, and we might also do so again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franca. This was a fascinating talk, really. Uh, I mean, you made us think of all the possibilities architecture have and have been, like whatever, like all the qualities architecture have been since its beginning. It's not just uh, theory nor design, not just material, but all of it together. Um, but before I may, um, you know, maybe I ask a question, let's see if um, anyone from our audience have a question for you. I have, a, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I have so many questions, but uh, probably it's not, you know, my spot to do that, but uh, probably next time. I, I thought like it was really interesting because I studied like Skidmore Wings Mail, SOM, and then particularly 1940s and 50s. Collaboration was, they were really following like, you know, boss model, combination of like all engineers and architects together. But it's also like fleeting moment they became so successful and then they became so successful. So it became kind of corporate later. And then there was like kind of brief moment of genius at a certain moment, which actually Gideon wrote about. Gideon wrote like, you know, genius of bureaucracy almost. Also that is the one thing. So somehow like, you know, when you, when you talk about uh, OVR and, and TAC, that's different from Gropius. And then R of is different from over our person itself because corporation itself become more independent later. And that's one issue. Also, <clears throat> second issue is like to me, I mean, they are more like a theoretical issue, but like I think like engineer now, like we had this conversation at the committee meeting this day. Students are more into like graphics, images, right? And then, you know, the teacher sometimes we don't teach like sections very well and plans very well. So the problem is, you know, engineer or, and, you know, technology. Now it's not like really industrial technology anymore. So we are like more digital technology, which is very immature in many cases. Does it make sense? There is no like really tectonic dimension. Absolutely. Um, I think you and Tai, we, we definitely need to continue talking. I think you have brought up so many invaluable points of which I agree with all of them. Um, it is a conceit, I agree, to focus on a very specific period of time, certainly prior to most of the techniques that were created during this period, having become highly managerial and highly bureaucratized. I fully agree. And many of our colleagues have done tremendous work at trying to really describe to us precisely how this happens. Whether it's the over-reliance on a kind of post militarized research um, infrastructure, um, whether it's um, a kind of hyper focus on return of the building industry, research only being done where you can get a positive return, whether it is in fact managerial practices that overtake how you deliver a project in an office, let alone on a building site, there's no doubt that something really drastic happens in the 1970s where much of the promise is no longer lived up, fully in agreement which is why I focus on that moment where we do have that promise. At the same time, I would have to agree with you that these waves of interest between representation and aspects of um, built knowledge do oscillate in and out of awareness. For instance, when I speak about Rondelet, and I did it really, really quickly, he's the first person who writes in print um, his chagrin, if I can say that, um, because most of his students are interested in producing those uh, amazing renders, which at the time, of course, were elevations and sections, 
um, wherein qualities of light and qualities of tone and qualities of um, character uh, are more important to encode than anything that might be happening in that pink stuff that happens to be the section, right? Many of these drawings, we remember them um, as having this kind of fleshy uh, tone to represent everything between the outer appearance and the inner appearance. Um, he's the first one who, in, well, he is an important member uh, of our community in 1802, where he um, uh, in print um, uh, voices his concern with this issue that our students or that his students um, seem to be less interested. But he also reminds his students that if you want to have the power to be able to fully achieve your design, you might want to know something about how those materials are making their way to the site. What are the decisions that are being taken to choose your supply source or your, your uh, supply chain? In what way labor is making its way to the site? And what are some of the environmental conditions that might impact the operations of your building after that design is actually built? So it is phenomenal to me that uh, 200 years out, these conversations are being had in the context of someone who is building the Pantheon, teaching construction in a school focused on mm -hmm. representation. But he's not the only one. Le Camus de Mézier, who most of my education, I learned as a person who was interested in proportions. In fact, the one book that was um, translated in the 1970s by Le Camus, Le, Le Camus de Mézier was his book on proportions and on character and on how we might design um, the hotel or the private residence of someone with means. That was a minor, minor mm. portion of his written opus. His written opus consists of books on building, on wood, on wood construction. Why? Because he dared, as an architect in the late 18th century, recommend to his clients to take a wood plank and to orient it in this direction as opposed to in this direction, because he felt, he thought, that if the wood plank were oriented in this direction, it could act as a joist. Not only would that be structurally more sound, but that would save 30% of the wood material. This is Le Camus Mézier. Guess what? He was sued by master craftsmen. And all of this is played out in print. Why? Because the architect dares know something about how to build. And in that dialogue, potentially turns upside down the whole kind of history of building and material consumption. Um, and here he is, you know, involving himself in this question. So I guess I'm, I'm more generally calling for uh, an attempt to kind of holistically reconsider our acts um, and even our intellectual speculations, even as educators, um, as translators, as members um, of individuals who work in the space of architectural theory, because architects have been writing about um, this other aspect for a long time. Oh, uh, I have a question. I um, appreciate how you took us like from the very beginning of, you know, the writing about architecture building and, and how like you focus on the, you know, materi materiality in, in the discourse and, and how you build like, you build the narrative on kind of total architecture, um, in in between, you talk to us about Eisenman and his, this moment of autonomy and conceptual conceptual art in architecture. So, would you see that moment like in antithesis to the to the rest of the more like total integrative approach, or or what do you think is um, how do how would you see these moments of um, trying to uh, kind of focus in one aspect of architecture? And kind of emphasize as a stress as as a as a maybe act of critique or so. Does it stand in a thesis or does it stand in, you know? If it does, it only stands um, in the sense of a future synthesis. Mm -hmm. As a person who spent way too many years studying the etchings of an architect who hardly ever built, and whose most famous works are theoretical speculations. I think the conceptual and theoretical work is absolutely necessary to the work of the architect. I would say though, that it's not the only thing that defines its theories. 
So it's really about kind of recentering or rebalancing what belongs, I think, to our discipline of architectural theory um, alongside the very important conceptual project. When Piranesi spends um, three different cycles working on the Carciri, there's a reason why he's working on the Carciri. Projects that never existed, spaces that never existed. And in fact, many of his representations are for potential contexts that never existed. Um, his writings, his um, even book essays really are, are all about ensuring that the work of fiction lives alongside the work of representation of the built artifact. Um, maybe that's why he invents some of the first cutaway construction details that we have in our discipline. So I, I'm um, reluctant to see it as antithesis as negative, but only antithesis as required moment of dialogue with the artifact. It's absolutely necessary, but it's simply a reminder to us that at this time, when I look um, post the year 2000, living in a moment of intense materialization, we're building more than ever before. We have more technology than ever before. Much of this technology is invisible, but also really quite visible. Do we have an, a premise whereby our students and architects are able to discuss critically about this content? And this is what I'm asking of, of theory, of architectural theory. I hope that answers it a little bit. Yes, yes. Um, yes, it does, it does, of course. Um, So, um, so today, uh, are we standing like critically on like, are we seeking this integrative practice or do we think, do you think that we, it's a moment of, of let's say more like critical moment in this kind of lineage of like total, um, total approach on integration in architecture or what, like going back to what Yunde was saying about representation and like not students not being able to grasp like so much the materiality and the tactility and I mean it's also like in my when I, I, I studied architecture we we built all the models by hand it was the studio was like a mess with like papers like uh, you know knives and now everything is like you know it's been like clean and like representation like yeah uh, so do you I mean, think to... this is this is you know taking yeah, I... of, of the materiality and the building and the yeah I mean to be clear I I really would hope that um um when I mentioned that part of Arab's genius mm -hmm. um and this is something I've studied um, somewhere else but also point to it in the book is that part of Arab's genius is that he discovered technologies and techniques of representation that we use today. Mm -hmm. And ways of thinking about the invisible that constitutes the body of the building, right? Uh, in ways that are absolutely essential. Um, and I consider that to be still um, our, an important hope for what we do and how we do it. So it's not a question of the matter or the technology. It's a question of our relationship to some of the questions regarding its use. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, you know, there had not been an Arab um, retrospective ever um, in England. Um, and in 2016, the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, finally put one on. Um, and one of the gifts that they offered us is really recognition of the extent to which these material artifacts that, you know, they have, they were able to build during this period were really predicated on invention in technology, invention in thinking, and invention in communication. Honestly, I don't think it's any different than it would have been during the medieval period. So I don't think that there are uh, correct or incorrect tools. Um, in as much as there are ways of asking such that the referent is the value of the built within the built environment. For whom, in what context? 
and and who is participating in this process. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes, please, Michael. Yes, um, I want to thank you for uh, what I think is a well constructed lecture. Um, I think that um, I I've been missing uh, well constructed lectures that uh, I was used to. Um, uh, as I was a student and uh, began teaching. Um, so I think um, it, it, you're um, going all the way back to Vitruvius and uh, Alberti and, uh, and talking about um, the, the kind of long range legacy, I think is, was, was very strong. But I, I also think it's interesting, although I think somewhat speculative that the, the what I think Gideon called the zeitgeist, the uh, Gropius was involved in, as well as Mies very strongly, uh, who uh, spoke in the kind of language that you quoted um, very strongly, and, and Le Corbusier, um, that that was a period of, um, of, of strong uh, ethics. And, uh, and I think what you've sort of suggested at the end and in this questioning is the possibility that that ethics is happening again in terms of issues of uh, ecology. And, uh, and there could be a zeitgeist around that. Um, uh, and whether that can produce the kind of quality of, of form making that the uh, early modern period did is uh, I think an open question. I'm not sure we should ask you to answer that, whether that's possible, but I think it's an interesting provocation. And thank you so much for that observation, Michael. I really appreciate that because you are correct. Um, um, I, I can't even imagine if I would have tried to introduce the important work of Mies, Van der Rohe, and of course Le Corbusier in this, in this space. My publishers would have dropped me, no doubt. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that they didn't already, but, um, but you're absolutely correct. And in fact, um, at one point, uh, the book did have the subtitle of the ethics of architecture, but I dropped that as well because that would have required really getting into the reasons. Can I just say that during the 17th century and the 18th century, um, the French, French treatises were called l'art de bien bâtir. So it wasn't just l'art de bâtir, it's not just the art of building, but it's the art of building well. So it wasn't okay just to build, you had to build well. And if that's not an ethical proposition, I don't know what is. So, you know, this is, this is and, and of course it's within all of these treatises that that becomes the primary goal of the architect. You, you hear it in Vitruvius, you hear it in Alberti, you hear it in all of them, right? It's only worth, this is not technical information. This is not speculative information. This is not representational information. This is ethical information for how you triangulate and you create this practice, right? So I'm in complete agreement. And in response to your question about um, whether there is such an opportunity now, I certainly hope so. In my day job, I teach um, construction. I teach uh, seminars on material and energy. I teach uh, high performance building. And if I didn't believe um, that these subjects can potentially um, bring us to some ethical opportunities, I wouldn't be doing it. So absolutely, uh, but I still um, um, want to understand how, for instance, new materials um, do bring up the problematic of material health. I do still want to understand how um, highly complex global networks for um, uh, uh, you know, professional practice and material supply chains give rise to um, unethical labor practices. That's what I also research on the side. So I think that triangulating these subjects, whether they happen in theory, in text, or in you know, practice-based uh, education is absolutely important. I also liked uh, Michael's comment on the new zeitgeist and whether it, it would be something that would demand like maybe a new, would it be something that would demand a new kind of collaboration between different specialists? Uh, if, I mean, in the past so far, it could be like the engineer and, uh, you know, um, different types of engineers and the architect, maybe now 
it's like more specialists that like will like uh, consult environmental health, like even chemists or like who, who could be this new group for the new zeitgeist? It's a question to you. <laughs> well, I'm inspired on a daily basis by some of my colleagues. Um, whose work, whether it's in design computation, material science, or thermal architecture, are constantly creating these intellectual, operational um, links between themselves and other disciplines on campus. And I really do believe, and I hope, that essentially there is a kind of um, ability for architecture, not only within its you know, education of the professional architect, but also in the way in which it creates these links to others on campus. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, I really do believe, and this is something that maybe one would have to ask um, more holistically across um, the way that we educate young architects is whether research is a strong enough subject um, for our design practice. Um, if design studio were tempered by research studio, um, I wonder to what extent we would be able to, by definition, have to introduce others who would contribute research knowledge that we don't have. Um, so I can talk about CUs and I can talk about that if you like, um, you know, as someone who gets a small portion um, and those who teach theory and those who teach environmental systems get a small portion of the curriculum, we might wanna ask ourselves uh, the extent to which in the 21st century, um, we can bring into our design practice research questions that, you know, help become conduits for conversations with others. Yes, uh, so Mr. Kaufman, well, you have a question? Yeah. Yes, um, yes, I do, thank you. Um, well, first I need to preface my question um, just by saying that uh, my background, my training is in sort of general design and um, I, uh, so I teach computer graphics and, uh, and also art history courses that cover, you know, the history of architecture. And in the past, I can say to my credit, I, I did work as a carpenter for a while. So uh, the hands on, I appreciate that. Um, so my, my question for, for, I realize you're, you're working with very kind of detailed, nuanced issues here. And I don't mean to step on toes by asking a rather simple question, but I'm sure you can turn my simple question maybe into anyway some something more. Um, do I understand correctly that you're talking about like going way back that part of the challenge was um, that between the engineer and the craftsman was that they required quite different skills, like uh, a person to have mathematical abilities and understand physics and all that was quite different than. Uh, the skills needed for a person to to work on the outside and work with the materials and the stone, and that over time that still is sort of the separation has been like uh, the architects are responsible to design the body, you know, the shape, and then the engineers are responsible to design the bones to make it stand up, you know, so it doesn't fall down. Um, but so my question is this: I'm just wondering if, um, in, with the invent of the, you know computer and computer assisted design, if somehow that has given um, uh, architects that would approach it more from like the design uh, design approach, that with the computer assisted design, it, it could crunch uh, information that's related to solving structural problems, engineering problems. And, and so that, um, you know, that somebody uh, trained as a CAD designer or whatever could work with someone like Frank Gehry, you know, who creates these amazing, sort of like the Sydney Opera House, but, you know, uh, amazing shell constructions that float, but they can design it sort of with a shape, starting with the shape, and then they hit a button and it generates a cut chart, right? For a 40, <laughs> for uh, 10,000 pieces, you know, all numbered and lettered, and that somehow um, those all come together. And that, again, the, the computer system design um, machinery, um, the question is, does that help bring these two skills together? That is of the engineer, you know, and the architect to help the architect be, you know, a bit of an engineer. What a great question. So um, first, um, your characterization of a craftsperson or a craftsman and 
um, a person who's interested in representation and um, graphics is, is precisely the kind of dual hybrid that I was trying to point to um, as actually being really quite consistent um, in our history and essentially um, more typical than not. So when we um, suggest to our students that they're becoming architects, um, that sort of single definition is pretty thin compared to the incredible texture that so many individuals have brought um, to the practice. So number one, you would be part of that um, texture. But two, um, in my day job, I teach building information modeling to my students. Um, I teach building information modeling because I believe that it's precisely in this potential of a collaborative platform that um, they can contribute part of their language. Structural engineers can contribute part of their language. Environmental systems engineers will contribute part of their language. Material spe specialists will contribute their language. It is a little um, totalizing, no doubt, as building information modeling can be and has been critiqued as being, but I don't yet know of a better um, foundation within which to have the conversation about whether in our digital infrastructure that we live in, there is a place that we can all share, contribute, and then potentially debate. Um, there still is a lot to be said about the limitations of building information modeling. But if I want to inspire my students to know that they can, see a project all the way through using that same interface that the builder will use, the material supplier, the equipment supplier, even, dare I say, the owner, the occupant in five or 10 years who will want to understand how their building is operating. Should the architect be part of that conversation happening on that platform? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and so, there are um, information-based and technology-based tools that actually make this integration far better, particularly if we ask the questions about how we are working with each other at various moments during that process. Mm -hmm. um, yes, one of the um, you know, first interests that I had to be able to introduce uh, information modeling in the teaching of a construction technology course was for them to be able to virtualize the building process such that they see themselves as builders, removing that separation that in 1949, uh, the AIA instituted. By the way, it took 20 years for the AIA to realize how wrong they were. And now we visit the AIA website and it's all about integrated design. Mm -hmm. You know, encouraging architects to actually sign contracts with engineers and with builders, placing all three at risk um, during the process. Um, so again, it's a kind of a way to recognize that our ideas do change over time. And sometimes I think our ideas um, contribute um, far better solutions um, than others. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I had this uh, one more question or like comment. I'm teaching global history. I'm really fascinated by the material. I really enjoy teaching global history. Um, but at the same time, I, I heard like weird stories from friends. For example, like I heard recently Ronald Martin and Mary McLeod discussed like about like impossibility of teaching um, critical theory now. Like, you know, like 1968 was kind of turning point. Theory became some kind of independent according to Michael Hayes. Now that kind of theory or like post-structuralism is impossible to teach because uh, why male became enemy of like anything about why male. It's a symbol of like oppression I heard. I don't know, somehow I defend why male at this moment. But I never expected my position, but it's happening. Um, but like, it, that's why I thought your reasoning like using Cornell West, quoting like Cornell West, it's not about like, you know, everything. Certain things are fairly important. So like that's your reasoning all about going back to the tradition of the art of building. I think your operation, the territory is pretty narrow because somehow like it can easily, you know, misunderstood at this moment. But at the same time, I think it's really, really important. I hope like I haven't read, you know, I will read your book later, but I think it's like, 
we not just like you know western if we like many parts of the world if we have more interest in like the the art of building in different cultures i think that can be really really powerful because instead of like somehow after 1960s you told me about the ideological like translation process sometimes like you know ideology critique criti ideology criticism from Manfred Tafuri, my place different generations somehow like made the theory away from like made the theory more independent from you know building you know process itself so i think like how i was you know how can your book more contribute to the more like you know changing the shift at this moment because I heard like someone told me even like architecture studio, they don't really teach you like actually plan and section because it was too much Western. So their process is like having automontage showing, I don't know, like it's breaking down the like oppressive symbols. I don't know what is going on, but I think it's a, like very risky moment in the in architecture education. But the your who can somehow like contribute to their kind of like expanding their horizon and then finding like new territory of like architectural discourse, I guess. Now that is a tough question. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, one could um, identify many of these sources as representing um, a canon, which does not represent a significant amount of our global population. And I make that very clear. Um, and so I can only speak to what is in the context of those texts. And I can only speak to my own heritage, which as far as I know, because I haven't really done my genetic testing is European, Italy, and North America. That's all I can speak about. And I can speak about these sources that were delivered to me as a person entering into the kind of architectural profession um, in the West. That's what this book represents. Uh, it is far, far limited. Um, um, it is uh, not in any way encompassing, in fact, um, the art of building as it has existed um, in vernacular structures. Mm -hmm. um, I make some allusions to the question of the vernacular and certainly not in any way in the kind of rich um, understanding of our um, neighbors across the world. It doesn't. Um, I wouldn't be able to speak about those uh, because I haven't lived them. Um, but um, to then suggest that I shouldn't speak about the ones that I can speak about is a bit odd. So, I mean, I guess that would be the sort of best way that I can um, um, answer that. I will say, though, that challenging means of representation mm -hmm. is really important. Because if you ask myself, me, do I believe that plans and sections constitute uh, a necessary um, um, media, intellectual media for our practice? I would say absolutely not, particularly if one understands the art of building, for which plans and sections are really a very modern construction. I mean, I don't mean that as a pun. I mean, they literally are modern forms of representing intentionality. And in fact, if we look at much of the way in which the treatises were written, they were written as, as pieces of reflection. So if you say to me, should we have our students mm -hmm. um, spending most of their time doing design build and then finding ways to represent, to code, to narrate their experience? Yes, that's much more in the spirit of fabrica e ratio, mm -hmm. as opposed to a theory of my project. So if we did away with plans and sections for a month, two months, a semester, a year, I'd be okay with that. Because then it forces us to re as long, as long as we are allowing that moment an opportunity to ask the question of what does that representation mean? How does it work? Who does it serve? Why is it being produced? Is it simply representing my idea as an architect? Is it a tool for a community member to get something done? Is it part of a builder's tools? I don't think we ask enough of those different questions. Like if in a studio, mm -hmm. we ask students to only media, in other words, draw, represent, photo, whatever, plan, model, virtualize, something for a builder to use, not for us to understand what your ideas are. 
that would change the nature of a design studio. Thank you. But, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I'm, I'm sold. I'll <laughs> buy one soon. You're kind. Um, thank you, um, Franca, again, and um, for the wonderful talk. I think uh, I also like want to to look forward to reading your book. Um, and uh, thank you to our colleagues and students for staying with us. I think uh, our time has uh, closing time has we are over time a little bit. So, um, like to thank you again. Um, and like let's all think about how to. What's the new side, guys, and how we can bring the teamwork again in our studios and our practices? And I um, guess uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much thank to you. all of you. And thank you. Thank you, you so much for thank what you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.